Hi everyone, inflation is the persistent increase of prices in an economy in a year. Simply is measuring how quickly prices are rising in the economy. Let's understand some terminology though when it comes to inflation. What I've done is I've given four inflation rates for four different years, year one, year two, year three, and year four. Let's understand what type of inflation is occurring in each year. Well, if we look at year two, Inflation is 4%, that means prices are rising by 4%, whereas in year one, they were only rising by 3%. So prices are rising faster in year two than they were in year one. We call that simply rising inflation. So there we have rising inflation. We can see in year three that inflation is still positive at 1% but that rate is lower than the year before. So prices are rising, but more slowly than the year before. We call this disinflation. Crucially, this is not deflation. Prices are not falling here. So as long as the inflation rate is positive, there is always an increase in prices in the economy. But crucially, if that figure is lower than the year before, but still positive, then prices are rising more slowly than the year before, disinflation. Deflation occurs when prices are actually falling in the economy, that means the inflation rate is negative, And that's what we see in year four. So minus 2%, a negative rate of inflation is deflation in the economy. Countries around the world will measure inflation by constructing a consumer price index. And from that index, they will be able to calculate annual rates of inflation. Now this CPI, this consumer price index, is a very useful way of measuring inflation because at the end, the inflation rates we get will tell us about rises in prices of goods and services that consumers are buying. And that means the inflation rate we get at the end is applicable to households. It means something to households. And that's what we're trying to do when we calculate inflation. So let's understand how we carry out a consumer price index and also then how we get the annual rates of inflation from that. Well, firstly, a family expenditure survey will be carried out. This will be issued by the ONS in the UK, the Office for National Statistics. And this survey is given to households who have to write down in a fortnightly period what they're buying, so the goods and services they buy, the price they pay for them, the quantity that they're buying, where they're buying them from, and the percentage of income they're spending on these different goods and services. Once all that data is then collected by the ONS, a consumer basket of the most popular goods and services is formed. This basket isn't real, it's an imaginary basket, but it's a useful concept for us to understand. So the most popular goods and services go into this basket. This basket is a very good idea because it represents what the average family is buying in a fortnightly period, right? So that basket represents spending of the average family. So we form this basket in the UK, it's around 700 different goods and services and the average prices of these goods and services is attached to them. All that data comes from the expenditure survey. Then we have to weight up these goods, weight them based on the percentage of income that they take from households. So for example, think of the weights as between naught and one. If households are spending 10% of their income on fuel, the weight for fuel will be 0.1. Okay, so think of weights as between naught to one, and the percentage will give you the figure. So similarly, if we're spending 5% of our income on something, the weight will be 0.05, okay? That's how the weights work, like that. So we weight them up, and that's important because if the price of a good goes up and we spend a lot of our money on that good, we want that to feature heavily in the final inflation rate. That's why the weights are very useful. So once we've got um, the weighted prices of all these different goods and services, we have to add them up, and when we add them all up, we get the total weighted price of the basket. And what I've drawn here very poorly, my drawing is awful, but I've drawn three different baskets in three different years, year one, year two, and year three, and I've just made up some numbers as to what the total weighted price of the basket could be. So in year one, 3,000 pounds, in year two, 3,100 pounds, and in year three, 3,150 pounds. Let's now go into how the index is formed. At this point, guys, make sure you've watched my index numbers video. I'm gonna card it there, but in that video, I talk more about what indexes are and how to calculate index numbers using these equations down below. So make sure you've watched that if you haven't already and then come back to this point in the video. But let's continue then. So now we need to construct the index. So whenever we construct an index, we have to pick a base year. So let's pick a base year and let's say year one is the base year. We know that in the base year, the index number is always 100. So year one is the base year and that will give the basket an index number of 100. We then need to convert all the other year numbers into index form. So all these different values, we have to convert those into index form as well. And we do that using this equation. We take the raw number we wanna convert, 
we divide it by the base year raw number and then we multiply by 100. So for year two, 3,100 divided by 3,000 times by 100 will give us 103.33. That's the two decimal places. Same for year three, 3,150 divided by 3,000 multiplied by 100 will give you 105. So they're the two index numbers for year two and year three, the index number of the value of the basket. Then to work out the annual inflation rate, we have to do the percentage changes. So at this point, the index has been constructed, but we want to work out annual inflation, right? So then we have to do the percentage changes between the index numbers, and that will give us the inflation rate in the given years. And to do that, we need to use this percentage change equation, the difference between two numbers divided by the original number and multiplied by 100. But remember, inflation rates are annual rates, and therefore the original number is always the initial year, okay? So we don't always go back to the base year, it's yearly. So for example, if we wanna work out inflation rate in year two, the difference between the two index numbers, 3.33 divided by the original number 100 times 100 is obviously 3.33% to two decimal places. So let's put that here, 3.33%. That's the inflation rate in year two. What about in year three? We use the same equation. The difference between these two numbers divided by the original, which is 103.33, multiplied by 100, and that will give us to two decimal places, 1.61%. So boom, there we have our annual inflation rates done. And the last part of the CPI index to work out annual inflation is that the basket is updated yearly. So once every year, um, items in the basket will change. So items that consumers are not buying as much anymore will leave and items that are now very popular will uh, go into the basket and also the weights will adapt as well. So there are updates yearly to the basket. At this point, guys, it's also important you're aware of the RPI, the Retail Price Index, as an alternative measure of inflation. But as I'm making this video, guys, the ONS are looking to get rid of it as a measure of inflation. But still, you need to be aware of the basics. So the RPI, the Retail Price Index, is exactly the same construction as the CPI, except for a couple of subtle differences. Housing costs are in the RPI basket, whereas they're not in the CPI basket. That's one difference. And also, RPI is calculated using a different mean, using an arithmetic mean whereas the CPI will use a geometric mean. And all that means is the RPI will give a higher figure, a higher rate than the CPI will. That's all you need to know, simple as that. Going back to the CPI, are the inflation rates we get from the CPI perfect? No, they're not. The first issue is with the average family idea. Now we like the idea of this basket representing the average family and spending by the average family of goods and services. And therefore, if the value of the basket goes up, inflation is rising, in theory, for everybody across the economy, right? Well, no, because personal inflation rates will always differ. Not everybody will be buying all the goods and services in the basket. Simple way of understanding this is take um, a low-income household versus a high-income household. High-income individuals will be spending money on foreign holidays, for example, and they will be in the basket. So in a given year, if the price of foreign holidays goes up, then that's going to increase inflation, and that will be representative of inflation rates of high-income households, but not for low-income households, because they won't be spending money on foreign holidays and therefore for them, their inflation rates will not have risen, but the headline rate will have risen. And similarly for low income households, they will be spending on bus fares. So in a given year, if bus fares went up significantly, again, that's gonna increase the headline inflation rate, but that's not gonna affect inflation rates of the rich, yet the headline inflation rate will say that prices have risen for everybody. Also, at the moment, there's a growing trend towards veganism and vegetarianism. So again, if the price of meat goes up in a given year, that's going to lead to higher CPI inflation rates. But again, that's not gonna affect personal inflation rates for uh, vegans and vegetarians. So that's one issue there. Not everybody represents the average family. Personal inflation rates will differ. Another issue is that certain goods will be subject to significant price fluctuations, which could distort the overall CPI inflation rate. And we're talking about food and we're talking about energy, specifically gas, electricity, and fuel. We know that these goods are subject to large price fluctuations because demand and supply are very price inelastic for all of these goods. And what it means is that if demand and supply shifts for any of these goods, there are gonna be wild swings in their prices. And because we spend a lot of money on them, they're weighted heavily in the CPI, that any price change is going to massively affect the overall CPI inflation rate. So for example, if the price of fuel goes up, then the inflation rate will go up, but that inflation rate is just saying that the price of fuel has gone up. It's not necessarily telling us that the prices of all goods and services in the economy have risen. So if we think that that's a problem, then we can always go to the core CPI. And all the core CPI is, is the CPI index minus these items from the basket. And that will give us the underlying inflation rate. 
uh, which is telling us the general increases in price of goods and services in the economy. We can also though go to the PPI if we think that changes in energy prices will actually affect CPI in the future. The PPI stands for the producer price index and all this does is it measures increases in the price of goods as they leave the factory gate, as they've been manufactured. And if those goods are going up in price, it's because costs of production are rising for businesses, i.e. energy prices are rising. Maybe it's fuel, maybe it's gas, maybe it's electricity. So if we see PPI inflation rates going up, then in the future we can expect an increase in CPI and that will be because of these factors. So we can go to the core CPI if we think the current CPI inflation rates are being affected now by these goods. We can go to the PPI if we think in the future the CPI might be affected. So that's how we can overcome this problem. A third issue with the CPI is that they don't include housing costs. Housing costs like rent, housing costs like mortgage interest payments, like council tax, like maintenance, like any repair work. None of that is in the CPI basket. So you could say that's an issue because households spend a lot of money on those things. But easy to overcome it, we just need to go to the CPI H, where H stands for housing, right? In the CPIH, all of those housing costs I mentioned are in the basket and therefore this has now become the new headline measure of inflation for the ONS. So easy to overcome that problem. And lastly, we could argue maybe that the basket updates are too slow. Is once a year to update the basket quick enough, good enough? Maybe not if consumption habits are changing much faster. And if that's the case, maybe we could argue that the inflation rates that the CPI is telling us about are not actually representative of current consumption habits in the economy. So that's inflation for you guys and how we measure it in detail. Hope you enjoyed that video. I'll see you in the next one.